This episode of The Recruiting Works is brought to you by HireClicks. HireClicks is a boutique recruitment marketing agency that helps HR executives apply the power of digital marketing and strategic advisory services to optimize their recruiting process. HireClicks saves talent acquisition professionals time and money by building and optimizing recruitment advertising investments, developing their employment brand, and reducing overall cost for hire. HireClicks collaborates with clients to select, implement, and manage best in-breed recruiting technology for each client's needs. To learn more, visit HireClicks.com. Be bold, choose HireClicks. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's Martin again, Martin Burns, um, RNN. Um, and I'm here with Stacy Gordon, who is someone who I've um, followed for quite a while, actually, and I'm very excited to actually finally talk to in person and, and, and get some of her thoughts and her goodness around what she does. Uh, so just a quick back, background on Stacey. She is the uh, founder of Rework Work and then and, and its leader. Uh, her focus is on, and I'll let her talk more about what she really focuses on, but it is on looking at, at, at diversity, inclusion, you know, bias, the workforce. She's a background, which is important to all of us as a recruiter, um, but also has been a professor. She's an MBA. She studied law at Fordham. Uh, she's done a lot of re remarkable things in her career and, and brings uh, a, a really thoughtful approach to to what we do as, as, as humans in the workforce, um, both as recruiters and as, as employees um, in, in HR. And, and, and to my mind, as one of the most qualified people to talk to our, our audience about diversity and bias and who we are and how we kind of connect together as recruiters and as people. Along with that, she's, she's, an, she's an author, which, which I'm excited to talk a bit more about, about her book about looking at unconscious bias, a um, book called Unbiased. That's a good title for, for, what, for what it is. And um, again, just just someone who I who I really admire and have always wanted to talk to um, on, on both in this podcast and in general. So it's a pleasure to catch up. And Stacey, if you could talk a bit about your background, I don't want to run over it. You give me your give us your story. Thank you, thank you. I'm so excited to hear that you've been following the work, and you know it's it's always um, it's just humbling, right, to know that people are actually paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Especially anyone who has kids knows that like you feel like you talk and talk and talk and no one's listening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, in this space, I have been really a champion of um, of work in general, right? The holistic view of work. So not just candidates, not just the employer view. I feel like a lot of times we pit employers against candidates when really they should be working together to symbiosis and um if we're not looking at it that way, if we're not looking at it holistically, then we're doing it wrong. And so being in this space, being able to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and looking at reasons that people are not getting hired, looking at reasons, uh, you know, because when I worked as a recruiter, I mean, I could tell you stories. I mean, I'm sure all of you can as well, but considering I was born in London, have a more proper uh, way of speaking <laughs> than, than some, um, there are folks who didn't realize I was black when I was on the phone talking to them and they would say things to me that I feel like they must not know I'm black because they wouldn't say that. <laughs> and, you know, so just being able to, to be in a place now um, as the principal consultant and founder at Rework Work, to be able to have the ear of CEOs and their executive teams and the head of talent acquisition to be able to say, we can do better you have to do better and provide them with a plan for doing better. I mean, it's almost like it really is just a, a great place to be. So excited. Yeah, no, that, that, that's fantastic. It's, it's, it, and, and I'm curious too, um, you know, in general, so how did you, how did you kind of, how did you get to this, this point where we're actually, we're actually advising company and leaders like this? What, what, what got you there? What, what brought their attention in there? What gives you the, the gravitas when they listen to you? Cause it's, it's sometimes I feel like we're shouting in the wind. Yeah. I, I mean, I think part of it is I have an uncanny ability to say things to people where, you know, I'll, I'll say something sometimes and people afterwards will go, oh my goodness, I cannot believe you said that to the CEO. And I'm like, I didn't say anything in a bad way. I didn't insult anybody. I didn't shame or cast judgment, but it's literally just speaking facts and truth. And I think for a lot of what we do, um, that's a great thing about being an external consultant, right? I'm not in the place, you can't fire me. <laughs> so <laughs> I can tell you that what you just said doesn't make any sense, especially when you told me that your goal is X, right? So what you just said is counterintuitive to what you're trying to do. Let's have an actual conversation about that and figure out 
how we get to the goal that you said that you want, right? The thing that you're doing right now is an obstacle and demonstrating how it's an obstacle and then talking about what can we do instead? And just really having candid conversations about what is happening in the workplace. Um, I think what makes me laugh is when I talk to a CEO or even somebody on their executive team and they say to me, well, you know, what do you want us to do? Like, I just, I, I, I'm, I don't know how we can change this. And I wanna say, in some cases I do say, depending upon how facetious I'm feeling in the day, but I'm just like, do you not see the title on your door? Does it not say CEO? If you can't change it, who can, right? Like, there is, it's just, a, it's a really a mindset shift. There is such a, a mindset of, we have to do things the way we've always done it. We have to do it this way. It has to look like this. It has to come in this package, in this box, on this timeline and anything outside of that. We've been so indoctrinated into the way corporate America works that even when we're doing things that make no sense and that are counterintuitive and counterproductive to our goals, we still continue to do them until somebody comes in and says, stop it. <laughs> right? yeah, I can see that. Well, it's sort of, um, yeah, I think about there's a, a something called a habit trail. Um, and I, I, went to, I went to university in a very cold part of the world with lots of snow. And if you look at the window went right after, right after the snow fell, you see the trails going from various dorms, always the same paths. And at the, at the melt of snow again, we happen to see the exact same paths again, because folks were in a habit of walking from one point to the other the exact same way all the time. And, it, and, it, and I think we're the same way mentally, too. We just get in these habit trails in our heads and we just think, well, I have to go from, to get from here to there. I must go this way. Right. And, and shifting that mindset has got to be. I think, I think rewarding, but how do you get there? What's what, and if you, and I don't want you to talk of, about clients, obviously, without revealing things, but any examples you can give us times where you actually cause an aha moment to shift that habit trail. Right, I mean, for a lot, so we actually use a, a tool. So like, I'll, I'll back up a little bit too, because you asked sure. me like, what yeah, gives me yeah. the gravitas, right? Yeah, to yeah, right. talk yeah. about this. So, I mean, I'll, I'll just say this. I, I have been able to, um, many of you may who are listening now might have watched my course on unconscious bias on LinkedIn. Um, it, it's still- I have, it's, it's great. It's, it's, <laughs> well, and it's still funny well, to me so, though. Yeah, it's really thank good. you, thank yeah. you. But it's still funny to me that there are people who, who don't even realize that LinkedIn actually has a learning platform, right? So if you fall into that camp, it, it's totally okay. Um, I think only 10% of like the 700 and whatever million people uh, that are on the LinkedIn learning platform even know that the LinkedIn learning piece exists, right? So um, it, it's a small piece, but it was the number one course for LinkedIn learning for all of 2021. So I say that not just because, hey, as a brag, right? Like that was my course, that's great. But the actual thing that is really important to me about that is that it was the number one course, which means what? That about 65 million people are paying attention to unconscious bias because it's not just my course that's on there, right? There are tons of other courses. So that means above and beyond all the other things, how to, you know, learning Excel, taking photos, learning a language, um, looking at change management even, right? All of these different topics that we're constantly looking at, the number one was unconscious bias. So this is on the minds of everyone right now and it is something that we know we have to solve. So I think that is really important. And um, part of how we do this is in, um, I, I co-authored a Harvard Business Review article on uh, storytelling and how leaders utilize storytelling uh, power. And again, a lot of times when I start talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, people think, oh my goodness, we're talking about this touchy-feely nonsense and we've got a business to run. But what we forget and I would say what leaders seem to forget is that the people that run your business, right, are people, right? What <laughs> runs your business are people. If you don't care for the people, you have nobody left to run your business. And we're seeing this right now with the great resignation, right? If you do not care for the people, the people will not care for your business and your business will not be sustainable and you will have nothing. <laughs> So above and beyond sales, above and beyond profits, above and beyond all the, the greatest technologies and all of that, we have to be thinking about what do our people need to be self-sustaining? Because when your people are self-sustaining, they are creative. They will figure things out. They will get stuff done. They will go above and beyond. They are going to be your cheerleaders. They are going to not stop right, until they are the best. 
but they're not going to do that for a company that doesn't care about them. So we might say, though, this is touchy feely, but it has major, major impact to the bottom line of our organizations. And we are seeing that right now and companies are feeling it right now. Yeah. From the just, recruiter standpoint, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, oh absolutely. That's I mean, they're, they're tip of the spear right now. Recruiting in HR is just feeling it. I belong to, as I'm sure you do, a lot of um, groups around HR and recruiting. And you know, watching folks on the HR side, including the HR side, like talk about their their days. And like basically, is it noon yet? Because I have some wine yet. Uh, it's, and that's a, it's, a, it's Monday. I don't care. It, it's they're 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 so stressed out that there's there because they're 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 seeing folks come in, start a job on Monday, leave on Tuesday, which it, yeah. and, it's, and that's not uncommon nowadays. Three three people for them one, one week might do that. They, they come and they go, and, and it's because I think to your point, you know, there's been a lot of lip service to culture, uh, but not a lot of delivery until recently, and and that's that's. I think a lot of executives are, are, are getting the hard lesson finally. And I think about- um, A lot of the delivery was too little, too late. Oh, for right? sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like band-aids on a gushing wound. So this is, here's the analogy. Um, I think about um, uh, Carnegie, uh, Andrew Carnegie, and the, he, he there's a quote that from him that I love, where he said, if you take, a, take away my people, leave my factories, in, in a year or two, I'll have empty factories and, and, and grass growing everywhere, and it'll be, I'll, be, I'll be done. Take away my factories, leave my people, and in a year or two, I'll have better factories. So he understood what the actual value was, what was important there. It's not the, the machines, it's not the goods, it's the people. It's right. the people, the people, the people. It is the people. And so to answer your other question, which I didn't answer yet, no worries, no worries. <laughs> which is, you know, how do you, how do you actually do this, right? How do you get individuals, uh, leaders to really see this and to start to transform and to see those, those ahas? Again, it goes back to themselves as people because leaders are people, right? Mm -hmm. And what they want to do, because it's easier, is to look externally and say, we're struggling because of the pandemic. We're struggling because of the economy. We're struggling because of all the social injustice. We're struggling because we can't find really good talent, right? We, we, can, we can pinpoint 20 different reasons why you're struggling. But the real reason is that as a leader, you have not shown these individuals that you actually care about them and, and that you even have any reason as to why you want um, to, to try to change, right? And to try to create an inclusive culture. Because for most people, it's just, we, uh, we wanna just check this box so that our stakeholders and our, our corporate uh, shareholders know that we're doing something so they won't bug us, right? That's what they really wanna do. So what we've been doing is helping leaders to see that is not, the way to go about it. And so they've got to actually do internal work. I like to call it the work before the work. Mm -hmm. You've got to do that work, right? That internal self-reflection because you can't have an authentic, genuine conversation with somebody who is different than you when you've never really sat down and thought about how that person might be different than you, what you might say to them right? What kind of connection do you even have? What are the similarities? What are your differences? How does that um, play into the workplace, right? How does my perception of what is good, right? what, it, what is a good employee different than your perception of what is a good employee? And how is that affecting the way that I appraise your performance, the way that I decide whether or not you're going to be um, get an advancement, whether or not I decide whether you have an opportunity to be the lead, right, on this client project, because how I show up is what's important. So we actually use a psychometric assessment and it provides us with a baseline to be able to kind of see where leaders are coming from, what their perspective is, and then help them from there. So, you know, we love to say that we, we meet people where they are, but we don't let them stay there, right? <laughs> Great. Great. I love that. And I think it's important. Uh, Culture App just came up with a study maybe two, three weeks ago, and they looked at DEI and, and the, the majority of, of companies are, are, are claiming they're working on DEI initiatives, but the minority are actually delivering it. So there's a, there's a, there's a disconnect there between the marketing and the actual, the actual delivery. Right. And, and, and fixing that's critically important. And, 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 and but before I start going to this, this, this kind of rabbit hole of how terrible things are, because I, I, I can do it occasionally, who's doing it right? What's, 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 what's happening that's positive out there? What do you, where do you see it working? 
Yeah, I think what we see is, and uh, you know, we get this question all the time, who's doing it right? And what's the, you know, who's, who's done it? What's the result? And I wanna say, you know what? Ask me in five years, ask me in 10 years. <laughs> because again, the, the, what we're looking for is this fix. It's like, which company has solved DEI? No company has solved DEI, right? Because it is part of, um, it, it should be part of the fabric of the organization. It's almost like asking, well, which company has, has solved sales, right? You've got some companies that are doing better than others. It swings up and down. Sometimes they're doing great. Sometimes they put out a product and it's like, ooh, that product did not work, right? And then they have to do a try again. And it's the same with DEI. What we're doing here has to be embedded into the work you're already doing. It can't be this separate and apart uh, thing. It can't be something that you delegate to other people. Every single person has to understand their role, just like you have to understand what your role is in sales, right? In generating revenue in the organization down to your secretary, right? If you've got an administrative assistant, what is their role? You might say, oh, they don't touch, uh, you know, um, sales. Yeah, they do because they help to make people more efficient, right? They are looking at cost cutting on when they're ordering supplies. They are looking at ways to make people's lives easier, which allows what? More productivity. So every single role within a company has a sales function. Every single role within a company has a DEI function. And the fact is we have not looked at every role and included a portion in there. And because we haven't done that and we won't do it, we're never going to solve this, right? And I say solve in air quotes, right? Because it's not about solving it. Again, it's about treating people as humans. And that is where we struggle because we say, oh, I treat everybody the same. No, you don't. Because if we did treat everybody the same, we have facts and figures that show that we don't, right? We can look at the surveys. We can look at the engagement numbers. We can look at the disparity in pay. We can look at so many different things that, that are completely showing that our lip service is not, uh, doesn't align with the facts. Yeah, that makes, and that's, that's, that's a good answer. That, I mean, it's not, it's not good air quotes to do what you just did, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a fair answer and it makes a lot of sense. It's a continuum, right? Um, and it, 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 do, we ever, do we ever get there as humans? Who knows, we're humans. Um, but getting closer, I think is important. So that, that makes sense. Right, and it's, I think for us, so yeah. I, I will say this though, the, the, pr the progress um, and su success for me is progress. So success is the input that leaders are willing to, to, uh, to do, right? The, 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 in the input that they're willing to put in. So if I see that and that's happening, that's success because those leaders are the ones that have to continue the process, right? Like I said, I'm not an employee. I'm not gonna be there every day holding your hand. So I can't be the linchpin for success the leaders have to be the linchpin for success. And so when they get it and understand that they are the role model for it, they are literally are going to make or break whether DEI happens in their organization. When they get that, that's actually success because then everything else after that, they're gonna be doing a bunch of things, right? They're gonna try things that aren't gonna work. They're gonna try things that are gonna be wildly successful, but they're gonna have the confidence to understand that, okay, just because I tried this thing and it didn't work doesn't make me an awful person, right? It just means just like everything else in our company, we tried something and it wasn't a good policy. We're going to stop and we're going to do something else. Yeah, that's fair. That's, that's it, 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 like, it's like, it's a constant iteration. So, so let me see this. So, so you're a recruiter in an organization and you want to influence DEI, sort of practical stuff, right? And, but, but you, you have an exec team that's, that's, that's essentially ignoring their blind spots. They have their blinders on, they just think everything's fine. How do you approach them in a way that will get a positive response? Because if you go in aggressively, it quite often blows up, right? Because they're, 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 they're exacts and they think they're always right. How do you kind of sell the idea that, hey, let's take a second look at this. What's, what, what would you recommend to people as an approach? Well, I think you have to start with, with the goal, right? I always want to start with what is the goal? Do we have a goal that relates to this? Are we looking at some type of metric? Most companies have this arbitrary, we want to, you know, let's say get to 50-50 um, gender equity in the workplace by 2030. And I was like, what is that based on? 
So it's a, it's <laughs> right. a dart. They throw a dart. They throw a dart. <laughs> so literally, that's the first question you have to ask is, what is the goal? Right. Do we all know what the goal is? Are we all clear on what the goal is? Because just because you set the goal, you tell me I want to get uh, I, I want to increase the diversity of our talent pipeline. If I had a nickel for every time I heard that I'd be a millionaire. Right. So you want to create you want to increase the diversity of your talent pipeline. That's wonderful. What does that mean? Right. Give me clarity. Does that mean that we're actually thinking about people who are differently abled? Are we thinking about veterans? Are we thinking about, um, you know, maybe older people who have been left out of the workforce because we assume that they're not tech savvy, right? Are we like, what does that mean when we say diversity? So you actually have to define it. And most people are scared to death to define it. So they're happy to just use the code word diversity. And then nobody in the organization knows what that means. So if you think that means gender diversity, and I think that means racial diversity, and somebody over there think that may, means uh, cognitive diversity, when I come back with my metrics, you're gonna tell me I failed because my metrics for diversity were different than what you were looking for because we haven't even gotten clear on what we're talking about. Right. So we first have to say, do we have a goal? Are we clear on what the goal is? Is the goal attainable? Is it based in facts? Right? Do we base it off of a survey? Do we even know what our demographics are? So many organizations say, well, we don't know the demographics of our workforce because we try to do a survey and our employees won't tell us. They leave blanks. <laughs> right? That's another big sign. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they won't tell you because they don't trust you. Why don't they trust you? Right? So before you could even do a survey to get the data, you've got to find all these things out. So I know you started with the recruiter, but it's like, it's very hard for the recruiter to be the one. You can start to ask these questions, right? And you, for your specific role, are going to have to be very clear about, okay, what do you want me to do, right? What does success look like for me in my role so that I can be clear about this? But then you look, see how it ties into everything else. And you see the, the, the struggle, right? It's like, we want to do A, but before we can do A, we got to do B. We want to do B, but before you do B, we've got to do C. And what we end up with is being all the way back in the beginning, which does frustrate people because they go, we've been here before. We did a survey. We asked the people and nothing's wrong. We don't have any issues here. Again, huge red flag. <laughs> people are just not telling you because they don't trust you. So for many people, the answer really is you do need to do some kind of external survey, because even when you use things like culture ramp or these things that you purchase, it's being done internally. Employees don't trust it. I have had so many employees tell me, send me emails on, on the side. I'm not filling out that survey. I didn't tell the truth on that survey, right? Interesting. Because they don't believe that that what is going to, so two things. One, they don't believe that the information in there is going to be anonymous. Two, they don't believe that if I tell you I'm trans or I'm gay and I'm in a hostile work environment, that that information isn't going to get back to other right. people and going to come back and bite me in the butt. And three, if I give you this information, what are you going to do with it? Are you really going to change anything? You haven't changed anything in 20 years. Why would I believe that just because I give you some additional information today, you're suddenly going to change? So for all those reasons, <laughs> the information that most of these companies are working off is completely useless, which data. is why the plans that they're trying to do are also useless because they're not working to solve the actual problems that they have. They're working to solve the problems they think they have. Yikes. All right, so I guess my follow-up is, how do you get past that? <laughs> <What are> you <laughs> you get past that. <laughs> with <laughs> the mindset shifting, right? This is why I said we've got to start with the leaders because the leaders have to understand this. And with some, um, there does have to be some external work. You probably do have to work with an external consultant to do the survey so that employees understand that information is going someplace that is going to be protected. And then there has to be communication that we are going to do something about it and a timeline for when you're gonna do something about it and what it is you're going to do first, right? Based off of the survey. 
So those things have to be communicated and they got to be communicated communicated again and again and again. So when you don't tell your employees anything, they make up negative things. Oh, and always. they make up the worst things. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nature reports a vacuum and they'll fill it with the worst possible things. <laughs> Well, right. it, it makes sense too because there, there's, you know, there, there's bad history there, right? And so they make assumptions and imagine right. the worst because quite often the worst does happen. Yeah. Um, all right. So, 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 kind of, so kind of looking at kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of bigger picture. Um, when you won't, when you, when you start working through kind of the impact you're having in organizations, is, is there? Do you see a, a curve? And I hope it's a curve through the better. Do you see a curve toward the better from the, in our in our corporate society? Are we getting better at this at all? Where are we heading? So you know the change curve, right? It kind of yep. you start yep. and it goes down, and then it goes up, and so we're we're down right okay. now. We're, right. we're, <laughs> we're in that part. That's fair <laughs> because. There really does have to be that place where um, the leaders get it. And right now, they're struggling. They are struggling mightily with this because leaders don't like to be surprised. And they think they have to know everything. That is a terrible combination for what actually needs to get done. I literally just posted, a, I do a, a bi-monthly newsletter. Um, and we just talked about the fact that DEI has to come from the top, but it is not just about it coming from the top in terms of leaders, but understanding that those leaders um, need to, they, they want that, that view from the, the top of the tower, right? They want the 30,000 foot view. And so what are we doing? We're planning on the ground for this view at the top. You haven't started climbing. You don't know what's up there. You don't know what it looks like. You have no idea what you're going to encounter along the journey. But yet you think that you're so smart and so intelligent that you're gonna have a, a, a foolproof plan from ground zero. That's not possible. What we actually need to have is a plan to plan, right? So I have a plan from ground zero and my plan is to get me to step one. Step one, I can plan for because step one, I can see. And that's all people want. They just want to see that you are planning to make some type of movement. But these huge, big, grand gestures that we're trying to do to say, we're going to solve, you know, we're going to have 50-50 parity, gender parity, gender equality, all these different things in five years in our workplace. Everyone knows that's a lie. So you're starting from a, a place of complete falsehoods to begin with. I, I, I'd imagine that that falls flat then when you fail because you're going to fail and you built up expectations too. So it's it's even worse in some ways. Right. And then the leaders don't want to do anything after that because they go, well, we tried and we failed and we had egg on our face. So we don't want to do that again. So then they resist even harder. And so that's why right now resistance is at an all time high because they've tried and failed, tried and failed. And I imagine too right now they're, they're so uh, stressed about hiring as it is. That all they're focused on is basically butts and seats, right? I mean, we're we're, not, we're seeing candidate experience falling by the wayside. We're seeing candidates who are just frustrated because they're being ignored and ghosted, and vice versa. Right. I, and and I can't imagine diversity is getting much getting it no, enough it's, attention. It's worse because we're still looking at it from this lens. So think about it. And I'm going to be really what's the word here? I'm just going to make up some stuff, right? Let's okay, let's go use for it. Purple, right. <laughs> so if if what we're always looking for are the purple people, right? We're going to be looking for the purple people. Those are the people that we want. And so now when we're in, a, in a, a dire straits and we need people, who are we looking for? All the purple people. We're still not looking for anybody else. So there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that are searching for jobs that are being completely ignored, completely ignored. You could fill your pipeline tomorrow if you actually were searching for diversity if you actually were open to all the people who were looking for jobs, but you won't because we are so blinded to success looks like this. A good candidate looks like this. They talk like this, they act like this, they show up in this package and I need this package. 
so that we don't see anything else at all around us other than that package. That package doesn't show up, right? We forget everything else around us and that's what's happening right now. So we have all these people who are dying to work and we have all these companies saying, oh, I can't find anybody. There's just no qualified individuals out there who want to work. People are lazy, they don't want to work. I mean, like for people oh, to even be saying that. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure the choir, but no, there, there's, there's, I think the estimate I, I saw, and this is, this is maybe six months ago, but I'm sure it's consistent, is there's 25 million people, hidden candidates out there in the U.S. alone. And they're the, they're the, um, they're, they're you know, soon to be retirees, they're you know, ex-convicts, they are, uh, they're autistic. Um, there are a range of people who are who are employable and want to work and they're being ignored because they don't fit to your point that kind of picture of their purple they're striped yeah. right I literally right before I jumped onto this podcast right I was on LinkedIn because I'm on LinkedIn all the time and somebody posted and I tell you like seconds before I jumped on and I screenshot it because I thought oh it says so many companies hiring urgently in air quotes, but not willing to hire so many rigorous interviews, but no follow-ups so many filled out applications, but no response. This is tiring and ridiculous. People want to work. They do. There's a guy in Florida, um, maybe a month ago or less who, who uh, did an experiment in his County. He, he already had a job, but he, he saw a lot of ads out there. He was hearing people saying nobody wants to work. So he was like, he was like, Oh, I'm, I'm going to try and get a, get a job. I've already got one, but I wouldn't mind like a second job on the side. So we sent out 30 applications, all jobs he's qualified for, all hourly. They pay for minimum wage to, I think, like $12 an hour, which the fact 12 is not minimum wage is, that's a whole other story. Yeah. But okay, <laughs> that was the high end, maybe 15. Uh, and and 30 applications went out and he got, he wound up only getting uh, four phone screens out of all, of all 30. Most of them didn't respond. Like, I think like 20 didn't even bother responding. And one actual interview that made that, and he got an offer for that job. That job was uh, it was ever as is ten dollars an hour. They offered him eight fifty an hour, but and they wanted him available full time, even though it was a part time job. Right, right. I remember seeing that post, and I mean, but crazy, that's, right? It, it it is the disconnect right now between company uh, leaders. And I, I keep stressing company leaders. And the reason I'm going to keep stressing company leaders is because we can blame recruiters all we want, right? But people aren't stupid. If I work as a recruiter and the hiring managers that I need to give candidates to only want to hire from school one and school two, I'm not bringing in people from school three, four, and five because that's a waste of time, because I know this hiring manager is only hiring from these two schools. So it's the hiring managers that have to do this work. Now, the recruiters have some work to do as well, right? They are not blameless, <laughs> but the hiring managers have to do this work because, um, and then the leaders also. So now here we are, uh, can I dare say post pandemic? I don't know if we're allowed to say that yet. I don't know where we are. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, Let's just say pandemic-ish. Yeah, all right, fair, all right. <laughs> and um, I was talking to a CEO recently and he said, oh, all of my um, employees are coming back into the office. And I said, oh, all of them? I said, there's no remote option? He said, no, I want everyone back in the office. In the very next sentence, he goes, but yeah, but we're still having a lot of trouble hiring. Wow. Okay. I can like, listen to that back. Mm -hmm. I am mandating that everybody come into the office in a pandemic-ish time period where people do not want to come back into the office and would at least like some kind of flexibility. And you've made this mandate, but then you're concerned that you your pipeline is shrinking. I wonder why. Yeah. I, I mean, Shocking. I just, I have no idea. I just, do you, right? <laughs> Amazing. And they're just not putting the pieces together. This is the part that's frustrating to me as a consultant talking to the leaders. And like, I know you were intelligent people. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm struggling to, to see why you're not making the connection between this thing you say and this thing you do. Well, to loop back to the start of our conversation, it's they're they're missing something. It's always about the people, and there I, I think there's this, this mindset among a lot of leaders to say, "Well, I'm just going to make this happen," because I'm a, I'm I'm power I'm forceful and I'm an executive and I can make things happen no matter what. And you can't 
make everyone people do exactly what you want all the time. You have to learn to be someone who can hurt cats and understand some cats just don't want to come, don't want to come to the office. And that's fine. As long as they get their work done. Right. Um, no, I, I it's, that's, it's, it's interesting. These, 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 these disconnects and, and this sort of breakdown. And I'm also thinking about yeah, on the process side too, where the tools we're using, we, 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 we deploy these tools of ATS and, 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 and assessments and, and CRM, et cetera, for recruiting. I think what sometimes they do is more harm than good. Like, like assessments will rule out people that are perfectly qualified, but because you asked the questions wrong, we set it up or the tool wasn't tracking properly, you never see them. So if some of the tests, right. they're not going to come through your pipeline and they could, and they could, you could hire them uh, or they apply and the resume winds up for some random reason, uh, you know, it, it, it's getting lost in your ATS. Uh, and and, right. I, and to I, me, yeah, that's where the recruiter, right? Should yep. be doing their job, yep. right? Yep. The recruiter, that's the job is to be combing through that ATS, to be looking for candidates, to be getting also outside, I get it, and pandemic-ish, but getting outside of just, um, you know, LinkedIn and, and Dice, right? And Indeed, and looking at where else can I connect with candidates? Just because there's also this another excuse that I'm so tired of is, oh, but everything's online. You know, I can't wait till we get back to in person before so we can do things. I'm sorry. What stops you from connecting with candidates? You can still get onto Zoom. You can still host huge, you know, recruiting parties. You could post a job and say, I am uh, looking for candidates who fit this description. You can put questions in on Zoom that say, answer these three questions, yes, yes, and yes. If you meet these three requirements, join me for a Zoom party. We're gonna talk about the job, right? I don't see any candidate, any recruiters doing things like that. These are things we can be doing. We are creative human beings mm -hmm. and we're just stuck with, well, I've just got my ATS and I've got LinkedIn and that's what I got. <laughs> yeah, I posted, I posted my job, so I'll wait. Uh, and then you look at the job itself, and you may have seen this study, actually. Um, a couple of years ago, um, um, it, Harvard Business, Business Review did a, a study uh, of job descriptions, and they looked, at it, they looked at application numbers based on the job description. And the more requirements you have in a job description, the less likely it is that women will, women will apply. Right. Because of our society, and this is, a, this is a statement of our society in general, we train women to second-guess themselves. Right. Whereas men, very frankly, white guys like me, We'll apply for anything. Can we figure when there's no there's no harm to follow? I'll, I'll get the right. job probably. I'll I'll have a shot. And, and and then I look at these. But then you look look at you look at almost every JD out there, and there there's you know, forty bullets. Maybe three of them are relevant to the job. The rest are all right. kind of nice to have. But the candidate has no idea which which one which one's actually the requirement. They think they have to match all of them. And right. so if if they match, don't match all of them, they don't they don't apply. And you're you're you're, well, you're, you're that's what I'm pipeline. constantly counseling recruiters and hiring managers to get to agreement on upfront before you create the job description. Because once you create the job description, it's like Moses came down with a tablet and it's in stone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we are recruiting to everything on that job description. The job description is like, what are the three must haves that this candidate has to have? Forget everything else. Get me these three things. But it's like, no, you know, it's like grocery shopping. We want this and this and this and this, and we want all these things. You know what? You can't have them, right? Give me the top three things that you absolutely have to have. And especially in this time period where people have to be flexible. You can't, you can't hire the same accountant, right? Uh, we need so many more soft skills. So it's not like the person who could do your job in person last year or two years ago is going to be the same person who can do that job today in a hybrid environment right? It's a completely different skill set that they need to have. So you need to see to make sure, can they do the job? It goes back to goals. What does success look like for this person in this role? And once you have that identified, what are the three things that they're going to need to be successful in that role? And then when you hire them, let them do those three things and then get the heck out of their way, mm -hmm. right? Who cares if I do it standing on my head upside down in a tree? That's impressive, actually. So, <laughs> right? It's like, did you get the work? Is what right. matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I've written. Yeah, I, I'm a I'm a marketer by by instinct, I guess. And I, I've 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 been a recruiter. I, I'll write I'd write these wacky, funny job descriptions, and they would be job ads, not descriptions. And there was there there's rarely even a bullet in there. More just like a couple of paragraphs at most to try and entice folks to come talk to me. But it would get seen by a hire manager. 
on the career site, they came to my office, you know, burned. But I gave you this job, this job description with these, all these bullets. Where, where are they? I, I, I don't, that's not you to tell me what to do. I'll, I'll get them in. I'll qualify based on what you gave me. Once they're here talking to me, we'll figure it out. But until they get to us, let's just, you know, let's just, you know, let's, there's no point to it. And, and they couldn't always get around, especially not to disparage engineers, they're great people, I love them, but they get fixated on, they want an exact rec followed bullet by bullet and getting right. them around, that their mindset around the idea that, listen, we can teach them other stuff. We can assess for them once they get in here, but until they come to us, you're never going to see them. And, and the trick that would work occasionally is, well, so what if, what if I found someone who didn't have any of these things, but they had a PhD from Brown and the, uh, he was here and they were at Google right now, would you, would you not want to talk to him? Oh, no, I want to talk to him right away. Always, always they'd say that. But, but they wouldn't understand what they were doing in the process. Right. So it's, 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 and again, it's, 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 and that's, I think, bias in a way too. You're biased toward a certain way of doing your job and your life. Oh, yeah, it definitely person. is. So, I mean, that's the work that we do is coming into organizations to be able to help them to see that mm -hmm. and start to identify it where it comes up, um, especially in decision making. So um, just if, you know, I'm always like, if we can just get one hiring manager to start to change the way that they make decisions, that's a win, right? So, you know, going back to one of your earlier questions, that's one of our wins, right? Is can we get you to just change? We're not going to get you to do it perfectly. And again, I'm using air quotes on this, right? You're not going to, you know, but if we can get it to where, and I've seen this, uh, hiring managers who say, I only want candidates from these two schools if i can get that hiring manager to change that requirement that's a win right yep, yep. once we do that then we can work on the next piece and then the next piece well, that's, but we the can't that's the mountain hiring that's the mountain <laughs> right you can't get them to do it all at once because that's just impossible it's a losing battle and I'm not setting myself up for failure. I'm not setting people up that I work with for failure, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. let's look at how do we get the small wins? Because well, they build up too, I think. I think they really do. Well, Susie, I, I don't want to take you too much more of your time here. I, I, this has been awesome. Great. I hope I was hoping for fracking this conversation. Um, before we kind of wrap up, you, anything you wanted to add? And how, how can folks reach you and find you and, and follow you? And what do you recommend? And I'll have links to your information in, in the description too, obviously. But talk a bit about you Obviously. and how to get to you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, a, 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 we have so much content. It's crazy. My marketing team is always like, oh, my God, don't make any more content. We have so much <laughs> Um, so, I mean, obviously the book, right? Unbiased, Addressing Unconscious Bias at Work. You can find it. You can buy it for your teams. I literally just sat down yesterday and signed 40 books for a team that wanted, you know, a group of uh, wanted books. So you can find the book on Amazon. You can find it wherever. Uh, we actually created a, a learning platform with where we're putting free resources in. So all of my newsletters, we've got over 40 different tips on the ways to tackle DEI in the workplace. You can find it at learn.reworkwork.com. My website is reworkwork.com. And, um, and for leaders who really want to tackle DEI and are ready to do this, we started a whole course called the Why of DEI. And that is something that we are enrolling leaders into just right now, getting them in because they're realizing this is what we need, something to help us create a plan while also working on our own mindset around this. That sounds really important. So, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get this out there to the audience very soon um, with, with those links again in the bio. So if you missed that, everybody, you can find it in the description. Uh, Stacey, it's been awesome catching up with you. Uh, it's, it's like I said, I've been looking forward to this for this for, this for a while. So good conversation, lots of takeaways. And, um, and, and that's all I got. So thanks again for your time. I appreciate it. And we're going to sign Thank up. you. Yeah, no, 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 you're welcome. This was great for me. And I'm going to say stop recording now. And everyone else who's listening, thanks for your time. And we'll talk to you down the road. And a special thanks to our sponsor of today's podcast, HireClicks Recruitment Marketing Services. Be bold, choose HireClicks.